Loving Father, we thank you, we praise you, we honor you and bless your holy name. Thank you for giving us one more day in our life, another opportunity for us to come to the school of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us every day. Thank you, Spirit of God, for enlightening our hearts and minds. Thank you for giving us that hunger and that thirst for your word. Today promises to be another day, Lord, where you're going to teach us some more truths. And we are all excited, Lord, for this class, because what we are going to learn today is going to set us free. Your word says in John 8, 32, we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. So this morning, afternoon, evening, where whichever part of the world we are right now, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving us the truths, for helping us understand the truth and truly setting us free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So my dear brothers and sisters, we are, as I said to you earlier, we are shifting from the Eastern narrative to normal times, the times when Jesus used to have his ministry. And today's gospel is from John chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. And before we go to John chapter 3, I want to just brief to you what happened in chapter 2. In chapter 2, Jesus starts performing miracles and people start believing in him. In fact, in chapter 2, we will read, there is the miracle at the wedding at Cana in Galilee. You find that only in John's gospel. And then after he performs the miracle at the, at the wedding at Cana of Galilee, where he transforms water into wine, he goes to the temple in Jerusalem and he drives away the money changers, people who are doing business in the synagogue. They have been selling animals, they are selling cattle, they have been you know, doing all sorts of things which are not acceptable in the, in the synagogue. And Jesus drives them all away. And then it says at the end of the chapter in Jerusalem, he performed many miracles. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. He performed many miracles and people in Jerusalem began to believe in Jesus. And you know, in this congregation where Jesus was performing the miracles, there was a Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was the ruler of a synagogue. It's something like, you know, the position of a bishop or cardinal or someone who's really in authority in the church. And this man, Nicodemus, has been there in Jerusalem observing all the miracles of Jesus. And he's attracted. Although he's a Pharisee, although he belongs to, the, to, the, to a group that is not very comfortable with Jesus, in fact, they oppose Jesus' ministry, Nicodemus is very fascinated by the miracles of Jesus. And we take the story in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, where we read in verse number 1. So let's start with verse number 1 with this background. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. Yeah, verse 2. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Look at this, my brothers and sisters. Nicodemus has seen the miracles of Jesus. He's come to Jesus not during the day. He's come by night. He doesn't want anyone to know that he is associated with Jesus. Look at the man. He is fascinated with miracles. He knows that God's presence is with Jesus. And he comes to Jesus by night and he tells Jesus, Jesus, he says, I know that all these miracles and signs and wonders that you are doing, it would not have been possible if God was not with you. Now listen to this, my brothers and sisters. Nicodemus was attracted to Jesus, not with Jesus' teaching and preaching. He was not attracted to Jesus 
because Jesus preached so eloquently or Jesus taught the truths, he was attracted by the miracles and signs and wonders. And you know, brothers and sisters, in the church today, presently in our church today, if you observe, what is it that really attracts people? Why are people coming or leaving the church? What is the reason why people are really coming to church? They come to church because the church is supposed to be a hospital. The church is supposed to be a hospital for people to receive healing, to receive healing in their bodies, to receive healing in their minds, to receive healing in their lives, to receive healing and relationship problems to be solved. Church is the place where they are supposed to get a solution to their problem. And here is a Pharisee, a person who, whose group opposes Jesus, but he's attracted to the miracles. He's attracted to the signs and wonders. And now he comes to Jesus by night only to tell Jesus, because you have the presence of God, I am interested. I am interested. My group isn't interested. My whole group of Pharisees don't like you. They oppose your teachings because we are all the people who follow the law. We have a system in place. We have actually very clearly laid down rules. Do this, do that. Everything is very orderly and very crystal clear. And we ensure it ruthlessly that these rules are followed and we make people follow these rules. But you come along and you begin to do signs and wonders that we, in spite of doing all these rules and regulations, keeping the Sabbath, following everything, every law to its perfection, but we don't see anything happening, no signs and wonders, no miracles. And I'm so fascinated, but in spite of the fact that I belong to the group of Pharisees, I have come to visit you because I want to know what exactly you are all about. And you know, brothers and sisters, when he comes to Jesus, he comes not with the intentions of knowing Jesus, not the intentions of trying to follow Jesus. He's coming there because he's fascinated by the miracles, by the signs and wonders. And you know, brothers and sisters, if today we are to attract people to Christ, listen to this very carefully. If you and I are supposed to attract people to Christ, not the people who are already inside, but the people who are outside, we need to bring them. We need to follow the great commission where Jesus says, go out to the whole world and proclaim the good news. It is very important for us not to only teach and preach, but to demonstrate the power of the living God. I tell you, brothers and sisters, unless there are signs and wonders, unless there is this word which we preach confirmed with signs and wonders, all that we preach, all that we teach is only going to be words. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, what happened on that day with Nicodemus? What happened that day with the Pharisees? The same thing is true even today. If people, you and I, are supposed to be drawn to a place, if we know that we are going to find our solution, surely we are going to be attracted to that place. And unless we get to the word of God, unless we understand that the word of God is complete, the word of God is going to give us the solution to everything. We are never, ever going to make that change of being making the word of God the final authority in our life. Nicodemus came by night. Are we like that? Are we afraid to go to the word of God? Are we afraid to proclaim the good news? Are we afraid to call ourselves Christian? Are we afraid to say that because we belong to Christ, we have the confidence, we have the victory, we have the salvation. Can we say we are saved? Can we say with confidence we are truly saved because we belong to Jesus, we belong to his word? This is the question that I want to pose to each one of you at the start of this class today. Are we saved? Do we really believe we are saved? Are we really believing in the risen Lord? Are we believing that Jesus is my Lord, my God and my savior? Or am I just a religious person going about doing the things that I have to do day in and day out? Maybe now I can't go to my, my weekend mass or I can't go for my weekend service. I can't join my church services. But am I truly believing in my heart that I am truly saved? And if I don't have the answer with confidence today, let this at the end of this class help us through this teaching that we hear today that we can say confidently, yes, 
I am saved. Yes, I'm on the road that I'm going to take the right decision. I'm going to take the path and understand that I'm truly saved. Brothers and sisters, just like Nicodemus came, today you and I are here in this class of the Holy Spirit for the Holy Spirit to teach us, to convict us. Remember, God does not condemn us. He convicts us. So let us be convicted if we are not convinced yet. Let us be convinced at the end of this class that we are truly saved. And if we are not so sure what we'll hear today, let the Holy Spirit bring it to our hearts and minds and bring us that understanding of what he really wants us to do. Okay, so let's go to verse number three. Jesus answered him, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Listen to this, my brothers and sisters. Any person, any man or any woman without the new birth, without the second birth, without the spiritual birth is spiritually blind. I want to say that again. In order to see the kingdom of God, in order to make an entry into the kingdom of God, it is important for every person to have two births. I want to say that again. The word of God says in verse number three, Jesus says, in order to enter the kingdom of God, we must be born again. We must be born again. And what is the meaning of being born again? The first time we were born was when? When we were born in our mother's womb. The second time we were born is when we believed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, as I said to you, if we have not received the second birth, if we have not received the second birth, we are still spiritually blind. Now, I want to take you and confirm this when St. Paul says in the first book of Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 14. Can we read that? I, and I would like to give that opportunity to you in the in, in this class. Someone who can read one, one book, first book of Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. I want you to read that slowly and clearly. First book of Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. Whoever does not have the spirit cannot receive the gifts that come from God's spirit. Whoever has not, can you say that again, brother, slowly? Whoever has not. Whoever does not have the spirit cannot receive the gifts that comes from God's spirit. Whoever does not have the spirit cannot receive the things of God. Listen to this, my brothers and sisters. Whoever does not have the spirit cannot receive the things of God. That's what St. Paul says. And that's what Jesus says today in verse number three. Unless you are born again, unless you are spiritually born, because the first birth is a physical birth. The second birth is a spiritual birth. So for anyone to enter the kingdom of God, there has to be a spiritual birth. Because by default, anyone who enters this planet Earth is having a physical birth. But in order to have a spiritual birth, the person must receive the spirit, must receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't come to you just by default. Somebody can't do something for you. Somebody can't do a ritual for you. You have to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you believe the gospel, this is the time you receive the Holy Spirit. When you receive the Holy Spirit, now you have understood the things of God. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? Only when you receive the Holy Spirit, then you can understand the things of God. Now, how is a person born again? How is a person having the second new birth? Let's open our Bibles to Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. And I would encourage many of you in the, in, in the class to please... Try to search your Bible quickly. Don't give the same person to read. Let's all be interactive. Let's all participate. Let's all be active and let's all, you know, contribute. So I want someone other than my ever ready brothers Gilbert to, to tell me what 
does Roman chapter 10 verse 9 says? Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Wonderful, wonderful, Sister Antonia. Can you please read that slowly again, please? Roman chapter 10 verse 9. Because if you confess with your lips. If you confess is, with your lips, listen, if you confess yeah. with your lips, so that is that is first step. You need to confess with your lips and then that Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is Lord. You need to confess with your lips. You need to open your mouth and confess him as your Lord. Okay. And believe in your heart. And believe in your heart. That God raised him from the dead. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. None of us have seen Jesus raised from the dead. None of us have seen Jesus go to the cross. But we still believe in our heart that he died on the cross and he was raised from the dead. Now what happens when we open our mouth, confess it, and when we believe in our heart? Now what it says, sister? You will be saved. You will be saved. There are two conditions, my dear brothers and sisters. One is the confession of the, of the, script, of the, of the truth and one is believing in the heart. Both these things are necessary in order to be saved. Both these things are necessary in order to be born again. Both these things are necessary in order to enter the kingdom of God. And you know, brothers and sisters, today what the Holy Spirit is going to teach us is going to change a lot of your mindsets, those of you who have only believed that it is your baptism that has made you saved. I used to always think along, I am baptized, therefore it's all over. Now I can live my life and do what I have to do and I'm saved. No, when I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, what do you mean by Jesus Christ is Lord? There is only one Lord. When we come to the Lord, am I the Lord or he is the Lord? I want to ask you again. I'm confessing with my mouth that he is the Lord. If he is the Lord, that means it is the Lord who gives me instructions, not I give instructions to the Lord. I don't come with my list to the Lord. I only come to tell him, Lord, I'm here. What do you want me to do? Give me your instructions. You are the Lord. What is that you want me to do in my life? What is the purpose for which you have put me on this planet Earth? Why am I here on this planet Earth in 2020? Why am I living right now? What is my purpose? You are my Lord. And if you are my Lord, tell me what is your instruction for me? But unfortunately, brothers and sisters, we only say Jesus is Lord. But actually, in reality, when we come into the presence of the Lord, we have our big list. And we are the ones who are giving requests to the Lord. And we are telling him, I'm the Lord. Please do all my requests. If you don't do my request, I don't need to come to you anymore. And you know, brothers and sisters, to say Jesus is Lord with your mouth is not only a lip service. It's not only words. What it really means is telling Jesus, you are really my Lord. You are really my master. You are the creator. I am only your creation. Give me the instructions and I will simply obey. I will simply obey what your word says. I will not want to discuss and come with my list. Now, the word of God says also another thing to us. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 63. Matthew 6, 33. Sorry, Matthew 6, 33. It says, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Now, most of the time we have a big request to the Lord. But when we seek him and we tell him, Lord, you are the Lord. And what you, what you are to me is what I'm going to obey. Now, because you are seeking the kingdom, because you are doing what the Lord has told you, it only goes to show because you are seeking the kingdom and its righteousness, there is no lack, absolutely no lack. There is no lack that you will ever experience in your life. Because when you are with the Lord, when you are with the creator, there is no way that he's ever going to have any lack come in your life. That is the first step. I confess with my mouth, he is Lord. 
Then what is the, it says? I shall believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. That means I'm also believing, although I have not seen it with my eyes, I have not seen anyone, I have not actually seen the, the, the Lord crucified on the cross. But I believe that not only he went to the cross, I not only believe that he took all my sins in his body on the cross, I don't, be, I don't only believe that he took everything that was due to me on the cross, but I also believe that he rose again from the dead. And now he's seated at the right hand of the father. He's a God who's alive. He's a living God. He's not a dead God. He's not a God where I need to do some rituals and need to please him. I know he's alive. I know he has won victory for me. And I know that he's seated at the right hand of the father. It says a high priest is seated at the right hand of the father who understands our every weakness because he has gone through what you and I are going through right now. And he understands everything that you and I go through. But because I confess that he's my Lord and I believe in my heart, now, because I confess and because I believe, now I am saved. Now I am truly born again. Now I am truly a new creation. Now I am a candidate. Now I am a child of God. Now I am a subject of the kingdom of God. And you know, brothers and sisters, both these things are necessary. The confessing and the believing. Now listen to this very carefully. Just confessing with my mouth, just confessing with my mouth is not enough. Also, just believing in my heart is not enough. I can believe so many things in my heart. My actions will show whether I really believe. But when I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart, when I do these two things, then only Am I truly born again? I'm truly and have entry into the kingdom of God. I'm truly I'm a child of God. I'm truly a subject of the kingdom of God. And where is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is not when I die, when I go to heaven. It is right here on earth. I need to experience eternal life here and now and today in this place. And you know, brothers and sisters, when we believe that, we believe what I just told you in Romans 10, 9 and 10. Then only we are going to experience the supernatural in our life. We are going to experience that heaven here on earth in our life. We are not going to experience heaven after our death if we can't experience heaven here on earth. I want to repeat that again. We will never experience heaven after our death if we can never experience heaven here and now. And heaven is not about just having all your needs met. It's not about having a big car and a big house and a, and a big fat bag balance and a great job and a, and a great family. No, what really means living in heaven is in spite of all the troubles, persecutions, the people coming against you, people rejecting you, people coming, you know, being your enemies, you still love them. You still, in spite of everything coming against you, because you have been filled with the love of God, because you have come to that realization that what somebody does to you doesn't matter. How you respond to people who come against you because you belong to Jesus, because you belong to the kingdom, because you know what the kingdom principles are. Now, when you understand that truth, only then can you truly experience heaven here on earth. And you know, brothers and sisters, I just would like to tell you one thing. The prerequisite, the prerequisite to enter the kingdom of God is two births. And if you have not experienced the second birth, listen to this very carefully. If we have not experienced the second birth, you know what is going to be? We are just going to be religious freaks. I want to say that again. A person who has never experienced the second birth is only a religious freak only going about doing their things, religious activities, without having a relationship with Jesus. I tell you, brothers and sisters, those Pharisees, people in the old covenant who followed the law, they were given 10 commandments, and those 10 commandments, they made into 500 commandments. Do this, don't do that. Don't do this on a Sabbath. Don't do this, don't do that. You must do it this way. You must do it that way. When you begin to operate according to that and not according to the Spirit, you know, brothers and sisters, 
you will be what is called as a religious freak. You will never experience mm -hmm. eternal life. You will never have a relationship with the living God, but you will just go about doing your religious activities. But the day you have the second birth, truly receive the Holy Spirit. Now it is the Holy Spirit that is directing your life. The Holy Spirit is the captain of your life. Jesus is on the driver's seat. And now he wants you to live a life of freedom. That is why St. Paul writing to the Romans, he says, he says, the one, anyone who is in the spirit has a freedom. We have freedom in the spirit. When the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I want to say that again. St. Paul says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But where the spirit of the Lord is not there, there is only religion. There is only do's and do, don't do this. And there is a bondage. And that is why it is so important for us to be ruled by the spirit, to be ruled by the word of God. And when the word of God gives us an instruction, because we know that when we accept Jesus as Lord, now we will accept Jesus as our Lord and experience. And let me tell you something. This Lord is not a Lord who wants to lord it over. He is a Lord who lovingly directs his children. He's a love, he's a God who lovingly leads his sheep to the pasture. He's a God who gives us the freedom. But yet, when we offer our freedom back to him, we give him our freedom. Like St. Paul says, I'm a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I become a slave to the word of God, when I become a slave to the Holy Spirit, being directed by the spirit and not by the flesh. Now, because I'm being directed by the creator, I experience a life of freedom. I experience a life of joy. I experience a life of peace. And I experience a life which is so wonderful in the midst of every trial, every difficulty, every storm in my life. There is nothing absolutely that can take away my joy, that can take away my peace. And that excitement each day just drives me on and on to go out and share this joy, to share this peace, to share this love, to share this kingdom with everyone I meet. And you know, brothers and sisters, let us remember one thing. When you really have received the spirit of God, listen to this very carefully. When you have received the spirit of God, Jesus told his disciples, stay back in Jerusalem. Some of us were asking the question yesterday. When you stay back and receive the power from on high, you will go out and be my witnesses. It was only when they received the spirit of God, they received the Holy Spirit on Pentecost that they had the fire within them to go to the ends of the world. They had the fire within them to share the good news. They had the fire within them to preach the gospel. And that is what you and I need to have. If, or if today we are so been caught up with our own life, we have been caught up with our own affairs, and we have forgotten that we need to right now go and reach out and share the good news. We need to ask ourselves, do I really have the spirit of God? Do I need to really understand why I quenched the spirit? Why have I grieved the spirit? And I need to say to the Lord, Lord, I repent. I repent because it's always been about me. It's always I. But the moment I crucify the I, and I say, Lord, it's no more I who live, but you live inside of me. You are my Lord. And from this day onwards, you drive my life. You be the center of my life. Let my life be driven and controlled and influenced only by your word, by your instructions. Because today onwards, I want to make you my Lord. And not I as the Lord, not with my requests, not with my petitions, not with my intercession, but with only one goal that I am coming in your presence because you're my Lord. And because you're my Lord, I want you to give me instructions and carry on with my life, truly living my life only for you. And you know, brothers and sisters, I want to, I want to share with you another thing. Nicodemus, Nicodemus was the ruler of a synagogue. Nicodemus was a man in authority. It took a lot of guts. Listen to this. It took a lot of guts for Nicodemus to actually come to Jesus because the moment he came to Jesus, there would have been the disciples would have seen him. Jesus would have seen him. 
eventually even if you if you, if you listen later in, in, in the acts of the apostle it was nicodemus who actually was defending jesus with his pharisees it was he who took the body of jesus and in order to to bury the body of jesus it's mentioned all about nicodemus that means nicodemus went through a transformation nicodemus was a pharisee not all pharisees lost not all Pharisees were condemned. Not all Pharisees were condemned to eternal death because Jesus said the Pharisees could not be saved because they were, had a mindset that they are only right. They only have the spirit. They only believe that what they said was the final thing. But they were refusing to believe Jesus. They were refusing to believe his word. And that is why they destroyed Jesus. But Nicodemus is one example. A man who has been totally you know, soaked in, in, in the law. He's a ruler of the synagogue. He's a man who's actually following the law to, the, to, the, to, its, to its final T and, and dots. But here is a man when he has an encounter with Jesus, when he understands that he must be born again, that he must have the second birth. Now he's transformed and gradually but surely he becomes also a disciple of Jesus. And that is what you and I are called, brothers and sisters. It's never too late in order to receive the things of God. Okay. At this point in time, I would like to have my brother Avinash. He has a question. Brother Avinash, you have a question? Yeah, brother. Uh, how is it? Yes, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah. Go on, brother. Hello. Go on. Can you hear me? Brother Avinash, can you do one thing? Your, your line is bad. I think you can ask your question when we have the fellowship later because your line is bad. Your line is bad. Okay? All right. So Nicodemus came to Jesus and he asked him that question. Now, let's go further to verse number four. Nicodemus said to him, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Look at this question of Nicodemus. Can I enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Look at this, my brothers and sisters. Nicodemus is a carnal person. He doesn't have the spirit within him. He is a law-based person. He's a person who's got the law. He, he's, he's a ruler of the synagogue. He's a Pharisee. He's following the laws. He's doing everything what the law wants him to do. So there's no problem with him in, as far as his relation with God is concerned in doing what is required to be done. But look at the question of his to Jesus. And that is exactly the, the, the response of a person who is carnal, a person who's a natural person, a person who doesn't have the spirit. Because in order to understand spiritual things, brothers and sisters, the person must have had the second birth. Listen to this very carefully. In order to understand the things of God, a person has to go through the second birth. And if a person has not been born anew, he has not turned into a new creation by believing in Jesus. The spirit that was dead at the time when he was born because of the sin of Adam. If that person has not received a new being, the spirit has not been transformed. The question that Nicodemus asked will be the same question that you and I will keep asking. How is it possible that I can be born again? How is it possible for me to go back into my mother's womb? Now he could, obviously when Jesus said to him, a person must be born again. And when you are see the response of Nicodemus, it very clearly shows that Jesus was not telling him to go into his mother's womb. Jesus did not want him to be born physically again. There had to be another type of birth. There had to be a birth, which was a spiritual birth. And at that very moment, a person who doesn't have the spirit of God, who's not spiritually attuned to the spirit, will never be able to understand the things of God. Just like how we just felt my brother uh, Gilbert uh, read a short while ago. First Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14 says, it is impossible to know the things of God without the spirit of God. It is impossible. We can try to use our brains. We can use our mind. But God's things are not understood by the mind. God's things are understood from the heart. 
And that is why, brothers and sisters, I may have shared with you some time back, the biggest journey in our life is not from, say, Mumbai to New York or from North Pole to South Pole. It is from the mind to the heart, from the heart to the mind. That journey is the longest distance. And the faster we can get that bridged, the better it is for us to experience heaven here on earth. Amen? All right. So let's go on. Verse number five. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. No one can enter the kingdom of God, he says, unless he is born of water and the spirit. Listen to this, my brothers and sisters. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Now, listen to this. When someone says water, immediately for us it comes as water baptism. That's what we have all been baptized. But that's not what the scriptures are saying. We are not born of water. It is, you don't need to be water baptized and then you need to get the spirit. Water is nothing but a natural birth. What is the water? It can mean the water bag in which we have been lying for nine months in our water zone. It's the natural birth. So you need to have two births. The water birth, which is the natural birth, and you need to have what is called as the spiritual birth. So these two births are different. So we are born of water when we are born at the time in the maternity ward. When we are coming out from our mother's womb, when the water bag breaks and we are having a natural birth, that's the physical birth. That's the first birth. The second birth is when we believe the gospel. And we just saw that in Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. Now listen to this very carefully, my brothers and sisters. Listen to this very carefully. In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10 verses 44 to 48. Let's go to Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 48. I want every one of you to please open your Bibles. And someone reaches there. I want you to read from there. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 to 48. If anyone reaches there, please read While it. While Peter please was still carefully. speaking. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. Listen to this. Listen to this. When Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon the people there who were listening. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. Who are these people? These are Gentiles. These are not people who are believers. These are not people who have been going to church. They are Gentiles. They are pagans. They are listening to the gospel for the first time. So as they were listening to people, Peter, the Holy Spirit fell on them. Go ahead, Sister Antonia. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Ah, even those who were circumcised, they were belonging to the Jewish. They were the exclusive people. They were shocked, astonished. They were surprised that the Holy Spirit had fallen on the people who were pagans, who were Gentiles. Did they have any baptism for them done? No, 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 no. They were not baptized yet. Brothers and sisters, they were not given any water baptism. There was no baptism done for them yet. And yet, as they began to hear the word of God, as they began to hear the good news, as they began to have the gospel preached to them, the Holy Spirit fell on them and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know, brothers and sisters, when you begin to read what happened in the early church, people began to receive the Holy Spirit only after they heard the word of God. So, you know, there's a, the Holy Spirit just gave me another revelation. You know, it needs two things in order to be into the kingdom of God. One is the natural birth. The second one is we need to be born of the water. The water must is the word of God. You need to hear the word of God. You need to hear the gospel of, the, of Jesus Christ. You need to understand the price that Jesus prayed. And once you hear the word of God, 
once the word of God actually begins to come into your heart, you begin to understand it. You begin to get into the spirit of God. Now your spirit is made brand new. And now you receive the Holy Spirit. You receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what Jesus said. In order to enter the kingdom of God, you need to be born of the water and you need to be born of the spirit. It's still not talking about baptism, brothers and sisters. It's talking about receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, I cannot emphasize to you more than this. It's really the revelation of the Holy Spirit. When we understand the good news of Jesus Christ, we understand the gospel. The day we listen to the good news, we believe the good news. That is the day we receive the second birth. We receive the second birth only by hearing the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us read verse number 45. Can you read verse number 45, Sister Antonia, please again? 45, no? Um, the circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. See, look at this. People who were circumcised, who belonged to the covenant, they were already believers. They were astonished that the Holy Spirit had to be was given to even pagans and unbelievers. How did they receive it? How did they receive it? They received it by hearing the good news of Jesus Christ, which was proclaimed, which was taught, which was preached by Peter after Peter himself received the Holy Spirit. And you know, brothers and sisters, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What happened with the early church can also happen today when you and I, who have received the Holy Spirit, you and I who have accepted Jesus as the Lord, I, I don't say that he, we are the Lord, but he is truly our Lord. Then only when we open our mouth and preach the gospel, we are going to bring people into the kingdom of God. And how is the people coming into the kingdom of God? Through the preaching of the gospel. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. In John chapter 14, verse 12. John chapter 14, verse 12. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you shall do the same works that I did. And then he says, you shall do even greater works. Listen to this, my brothers and sisters. In John 14, 12, he says, if you believe in me, you shall do the same works that I did. And we all know what Jesus did, what works, raising the dead, casting out devils, laying hands on the sick, all those miracles that he did. That is what you and I are supposed to do. But he says, we can even do greater things. And you know, what are the greater things we have, he was talking about? This is exactly what he was talking about. That once we receive the Holy Spirit, we would go out and proclaim the good news and we would make people believers of the lord jesus christ look at the power that is available with you and me brothers and sisters when we have the holy spirit we are convinced that the spirit of god is with us when we open our mouth and we speak the good news we demonstrate that word which we preach with accompanying signs and wonders we use the feelings as a bell to attract people into the kingdom just like nicodemus was attracted by the miracles now we are going to draw the people into the kingdom. We are going to recruit people into the kingdom. We are not interested to make converts, brothers and sisters. We are interested to make believers. We want to make people who are believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And believers of the Lord Jesus Christ only happen when they believe God's word. They believe the truth of the word. They believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is why you and I, who are in this class, those of us who are listening, those of us who will take this word that you're listening and share it with others, those people will listen to the good news and they will be having a second birth if they have not had. And they will also become believers, believers of whom? Of the word, believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they too will also experience heaven here on earth. Brothers and sisters, I also want to give another example. In Acts chapter 11 verses 1 to 18. Let's open Acts chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. I don't want to take you there for the whole part of the chapter, but let's just see what it says in Acts chapter 11. There was another incident that took place there. Another time where the Holy Spirit fell on Gentiles. Anyone there, you can start reading, please. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea 
hear that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So, when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Now listen to this, brothers and sisters. We won't read the whole chapter. When the Holy Spirit fell on unbelievers, those who were Gentiles, when they heard the gospel, those non-believers or unbelievers were no longer Gentiles. They also became members of the body of Christ. They also became members of the church of Christ. They also became, they also got an entry into the kingdom of God. Now see what happens. The people who are already in the kingdom, they start criticizing Peter. They said, how could you go to people who are not even believers? How can you preach the gospel to Gentiles? How can you go and try to give them the Holy Spirit? And that is the time Peter opens his mouth in chapter 11. And he says, while I was talking to them, while I was preaching to them, the Holy Spirit fell on them. And that who was I to stop them from receiving the Holy Spirit? Who am I? God is the one who gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And how does he give it to us? Only when we hear the gospel, when we believe the gospel, when we take action on the word that we are listening, only then we receive the Holy Spirit. You know, brothers and sisters, a life without the Holy Spirit is a religious life. A life without the Holy Spirit is a dead life. A life without the Holy Spirit is just a life of do's and don'ts. It's a life of rules and regulations. But a life of the Holy Spirit is a life of freedom, is a life where the Holy Spirit directs you, a life which is exciting, a life which is life-giving, a life which, is which, which, which basically lets you go out and share the good news. You know, brothers and sisters, when the Holy Spirit is with you, and you have experienced God's love because the word of God says in Romans 5, 5, the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Romans 5, 5 says that only when you have received the Holy Spirit that you can experience the love of God. And if you have truly experienced the Holy Spirit, you have received the love of God. You can't hold that love of God in your heart and hold it only to yourself. It has to be shared. It's not like the love that you have for self or love for your family or love for your own things. It's a love that you have received from God. And a God kind of love cannot be held with a person inside. It has to be shared. The gospel has to be shared. You have to go out and demonstrate the power of God. Brothers and sisters, today, you and I have to ask ourselves a question. If we are not going out, if we are not right now having that boldness to share the gospel, maybe some of us will say, I don't know the Bible yet. So what? Is it over? Today is the day you can start. I don't know anything about scriptures. Why not? You can start today. You can start right now after this class. This is, the, this is an opportunity for you to go to the word, to study the word, to reflect on the word, to meditate on the word, to do what the word says and truly tell the Lord, Lord, I want to do what your word says. I don't know what it's going to cost me. I don't know what I'm going to lose, but I am going to spend time with your word and not only spend time, I'm going to make a decision to do what your word says. You know, brothers and sisters, the day you make that decision, you make that commitment. I tell you, the Holy Spirit, the whole, the creator is going to back you up. Don't you ever think that when you make a decision to walk in the righteousness of God, to walk according to God's word, that God is going to bring obstacles in your path. He's going to send his angels to protect you. He's going to cooperate with you. The Holy Spirit is going to teach you. There will be persecution. There will be obstacles which will come from the kingdom of darkness. But because you have the presence of the living God, in spite of the persecution, in spite of all the insults, in spite of all the rejection, in spite of all the humiliation, in spite of all the things that will come against you from the other side, you will still be victorious because your faith will always overcome because you know to whom you belong. I said, when you know to whom you belong, you know whom you have with you, you have the creator with you, you can never fail because being with him is always victory because he has already won the victory for us. Amen? Okay. Look at what St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 
1 verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 17. Let's open that. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. Look at this, brothers and sisters. St. Paul was written virtually about 60-65% of the Bible. What is he saying? God did not send me to baptize. God did not send me to baptize. He's not undermining or he's saying that baptism is not important. But what is he saying, brothers and sisters? He's saying that God did not send us to be baptized. Why? Because he knows from the revelation he has received that it's not by baptism that a person is saved. It is by believing that he's saved. And that is why his ministry was the teaching ministry. His ministry was the one of preaching the word. His ministry was to demonstrate the word. You know, brothers and sisters, if we go to Mark chapter 16, I want you, all of you, every single one of you in this Bible study, I want you to go to Mark chapter 16, verse 16. And let us all read that together. Today, a big stronghold from your mind is going to be broken. Let us go to Mark, Mark chapter 16, verse 16. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved. Does it only say the one who is baptized will be saved? No, my dear brothers and sisters. It requires two things. It requires us to believe. And it requires to be baptized. It requires us to believe and it requires us to be baptized. So without believing, there is no way that I can be saved. Let's go to the next verse and see what it says. But the one who does not, be, does not believe will be condemned. The one who does not believe will be condemned. Who's speaking these words? These are not coming from a third party. These are coming from the mouth of Jesus. Jesus is saying, the one who believes and is baptized will be saved. But the one who does not believe will be condemned. St. Paul says, I was not sent to baptize. I was sent to preach the gospel. I was sent to demonstrate the power of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, if today we are only preaching the word, we are only teaching the word, but we are not demonstrating the word. There is going to be absolutely disinterest in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if that gospel that is preached can be confirmed with accompanying signs and wonders, can be demonstrated, the word that is preached can be confirmed because when the word, the true gospel is being preached, the Holy Spirit is always present there. And when the Holy Spirit is always present there, there are going to be signs and wonders. Let us listen to what it says further in Mark chapter 16. Go ahead. And these signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will, they will pick up snakes in their hands. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. These are the signs that will follow those who believe. Remember, brothers and sisters, Jesus says, only those who believe and are baptized will be saved. And if we are truly believers, then as believers, these are the signs that will follow. We shall lay hands on the sick and they shall be healed. We shall be able to cast out devils. We, even if we drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt us. We shall be able to speak in new tongues. We shall be able to speak in the spirit. And all these things will happen only to a believer. Brothers and sisters, we need to ask ourselves a question. Am I truly believing the gospel of Jesus Christ? Am I truly believing his word? This is the question that we need to ask ourselves. Why? Why? Because the word of God says, if I don't believe, then I'm not going to be saved. All those who do not believe 
shall be condemned. Look at this, brothers and sisters. These are not my words. These are not the words of any preacher. These are not words that are written in any history book. These are words coming from the creator who died for you and me on the cross. And he wants us to believe his word. He says, all those who do not believe shall be condemned. And you know, it's high time for us, brothers and sisters, to become believers. It's high time for us to believe the gospel. It's high time for us to take the word of God seriously. It's high time for us to make the effort to find the time to find every effort in our, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our busy schedule in order to take the word of God, to study the word of God, to dwell on the word of God, to research the word of God and to do what it says. Because only when we accept Jesus as Lord, only when we do what his word says, then only, then only we will be saved. And in order to be saved, in order to be saved, we have to be believers. We can't be religious freaks. And brothers and sisters, if we truly are believers, then when we go out and open our mouth and share the good news, the Holy Spirit will always back the words that we speak with accompanying signs and wonders. Listen to this, my brothers and sisters. It's not about just preaching the gospel. It's not just about speaking words. It's not giving about giving a great homily. It's not about giving a great sermon. It's about demonstrating the power of God, demonstrating it with signs and wonders. And if that is not happening today in the church, it's time for you and me. It's time for you and me to make that study, to make the correction, to repent and to start believing the good news. And brothers and sisters, I cannot even go any more further than this or dwell on it in a much more with more emphasis, except to encourage you to plead with you. That during this time when we have so much on our hands that we will take this time seriously that we shall go to the word of God we'll study it and we'll make every effort from this day onwards not only because we got the time but even in our busy schedule to give the word of God its due respect to its due priority its due honor its due due place in our life because only then only then can we really be effective in our Christian life. It's only then that we can truly be able to resist and fight the enemy. And remember, brothers and sisters, just because you have the word of God, just because you are a believer, doesn't mean that you are immune from persecution. You are immune from difficulties. You are immune from storms in your life. But praise God, because you have the word, because you have the spirit of God, because you are being directed by the word of God, brothers and sisters, you will always overcome every storm in your life like an eagle you will able to fly above your storm and in fact when the storms come of your life you will fly above your storm and actually enjoy the storm while all the others around you are falling like a pack of cards it's important for the brothers and sisters for us to realize this truth and make the necessary correction today right now i believe that as the lord is talking to you and me we are indeed making that resolve, making that decision, making that commitment. And I pray that this day onwards will be a day for us, a new day, a new day of decision making, a new day of new directions, a new day of the fire of the Holy Spirit, that we can truly be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. Amen. 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 So let's go to verse number six. Verse number six. What is born of the spirit, what is born of the flesh is flesh. And what is born of the spirit is spirit. Look at this, brothers and sisters. If a person is a natural person who doesn't have the Holy Spirit, when they hear the word of God, they will not understand the word of God. It'll just go over your head. You will think, what is this word of God? Why am I not able to understand it? The word of God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the God of this earth has put a screen, has put a blinder over people so that they cannot believe. But it's only when we go to the word of God and try to and make every effort to understand it, make every effort. If we can't understand it, we will call somebody. We will be hungry. Please explain it to me. Call someone. Do the research. Go searching for it. Like if, for example, you know there's a particular sickness. Doctor has given you a report. How many times would we go to Google 
How many times will go and call for a second opinion? How many of us will go for a third opinion? How many of us will go to Yahoo? How many of us will go to Google and try to search about that medication? Because we want to search and research that, that sickness that has been told to us. When we can avoid all that, and start researching God's word. See what God's word says. The same effort that we do for a particular situation or for a sickness or in order to get admission or in order to find out about the report of the doctor. That same effort that we do, if we do it for the word of God, going to the, to the limits, going to the even required to the ends of the earth in order to get an understanding of it. I tell you, brothers and sisters, that veil, that block which is in our path, will be removed because we are hungry for the word. And I want to tell you, brothers and sisters, let that hunger, let that thirst for the word just grow within us today, from today onwards. Unless there is a hunger for the word, unless there is a thirst for the word, there is no way that we are ever going to be effective, ever we are going to see the kingdom of God. And it is important for us, each one of us, to see the kingdom of God now. You know, brothers and sisters, when a person is a natural person, he will never be able to see anything outside his five senses. And what are the five senses? What I see, what I hear, what I taste, what I smell, and what I feel. A natural person cannot see anything beyond their five senses. Only a person in the spirit can see what is called as the sixth sense, which is called faith. And how will a person get faith? A person will get faith only when he has had the second birth. His spirit has been made brand new. He's born again as what the scriptures say. When his spirit becomes brand new, the presence of God, the faith of God is already lying inside of him. The spirit of God is living inside of him. The only effort that he has to do for the rest of his life is take the word of God and renew this mind. Bring this mind in, in, in harmony or in agreement with God's word and that power which is in our spirit and that power that we receive by renewing our mind gives us the victory. It's such a wonderful truth, brothers and sisters. Faith can only come when we are renewed. Faith cannot come to a person who's not born again. You know, remember, in order to receive the gift of faith, the measure of faith which has been put inside of us, it's a gift for us. The gift, according to Romans chapter 13, verse 4. If you go to Romans chapter 13, verse 4, it says that faith is a gift. We have all been given the measure of faith. And so, brothers and sisters, it is very important for us that this faith which is inside of us, which is in our spirit, can, if it is just lying there and not being utilized, then we need to make the effort to bring this mind, to renew this mind, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It's only by the renewing of the mind, drawing that power which is inside our spirit, we can get the victory. Otherwise, we will only be operating according to our five senses, and our five senses will never allow us to be subjects of the kingdom of God. The, the operating according to our five senses can never let us have an experience with God. Because in order to experience God, in order to communicate it with God, you, we must communicate with him only in the spirit. That's why Jesus, when he was talking to the Samaritan woman, I mentioned briefly yesterday in John chapter 4, verse 23, he says, true worshipers shall worship God in spirit and in truth. Spirit, why? Because the spirit has got all the faith inside. That's the second birth that we had. And truth is according to his word. We had a discussion yesterday after the class and we were talking about how we need to pray, how we need to intercede according to the truth, according to his word. And only when we speak God's word back to him that we can receive everything of God. Brothers and sisters, it is important for us to renew our mind, not just today, not just tomorrow, but as long as we are breathing, we need to keep this mind alert, sensitive to the frequency of the spirit, to sensitive to the word and to be directed to the word in order to receive the things of God. Verse number seven. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. You know, brothers and sisters, Jesus had to tell Nicodemus not to be amazed. 
not to be surprised because Jesus was telling you have to be born again. You have to be born from above. He's just telling him because at that very moment, Nicodemus is a natural man. He's not an evil man. He's not a sinful man, but he's a natural man. He's a man who does the law. He does this and does that. He's got rules and regulations. No one can have a relationship with God by doing rules and regulations, brothers and sisters. The only way to have a relationship with God, the only way to have a relationship with the living God is through his word, is by going by faith. And that is what Jesus was telling Nicodemus. Verse 8. Let us go to verse 8. The wind blows and chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Look at this, brothers and sisters. The spirit realm, there are, there are how many kingdoms? There are actually three kingdoms. One is it's a God's kingdom. One is the kingdom of this world. And what is the kingdom of darkness? That is the kingdom of Satan. Now, people who are natural may not necessarily be belong to the kingdom of the devil. They may be natural people, like kingdom of this world. But there are three kingdoms. So Jesus is saying the spiritual realm, the kingdom of God, is actually so real. It is just like a person who sees, who, who, who know, when the wind is blowing, he cannot see the wind. But he knows the effect of the wind. If a person can feel the effect of this wind, which he can't see, and yet he can't believe the wind in the same way a natural person cannot believe the spiritual realm because he can't see it. But a spiritual realm is not to be seen by the physical eyes. It is to be seen with the eyes of faith. It is to be seen through faith alone. And you know what, brothers and sisters, the spiritual realm, the spiritual kingdom is the parent one. It's the real kingdom. What you see with your hands, with your legs, what you see with the eyes is actually the child. The parent one is the spiritual realm. The, the real kingdom that you, are, you and I are living right now is a product of what is already been in the spiritual realm. And so if we can believe the parent, we have had everything with us. But most of the time, because we don't know the word, because we are not in the spiritual realm, because we are not really sure whether we are born again, our, our focus is only limited to our five senses. Today, you and I are called to make the correction. You and I are called to dwell on the word of God. You and I are called to develop that sixth sense so that we can receive everything from the kingdom of God. We can receive the complete package of salvation. And the package of salvation is so beautiful, brothers and sisters. You don't need to sweat. You don't need to do rules and regulation. You don't need to do this way and that way. You only need to believe. And when you and I believe the word, it is a free gift to us because on that cross, it is all finished. It is all completed by Jesus. Let our prayer today be that from today onwards, we are going to be believers and less religious. I say again, we are going to be believers and rest, less religious. We are going to believe the good news. And when we believe the good news, we are going to reach out and make new believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's close our eyes and let's pray. Loving Father, thank you so much for teaching us today. Thank you for giving us these truths. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to understand that it's only by believing your word. It's by operating by faith, by understanding that only by being born again, by having the second birth, that we can truly be subjects of your kingdom. Lord, we have gone about our life. We have gone about our activities, even in our relationship with others and relationship with you, only based on rules and regulations, based on what we have been told, what we have been explained. But today, Lord, we have understood that it is your word, your freedom giving word, your freedom giving truth that sets us free. Help us, Lord, to sit under in the school of the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to teach us. Allow the Holy Spirit to enlighten our minds. Remove the darkness within us. Remove all the teachings that we have been indoctrinated. And Lord, help us to believe the truth of the gospel and experience the victory that you have already won for us on the cross. I thank you and praise you, Father, for all this. In the glorious name of Jesus. Amen.